Good morning, welcome. May I request everyone to please take their seats. We will begin very shortly. May I also request everyone to please put their phones on silent mode. Good morning everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the Dr. Granville Austin Memorial Lecture on the theme Granville Austin and Transformative Constitutionalism. I extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guests and members of the audience who have joined us today. I am so pleased to welcome Mr. Vikram Raghavan, international lawyer and researcher who will be delivering today's lecture. Mr. Vikram Raghavan is an international lawyer by profession. He is the author of the much cited and consulted treatise, Communications Law in India. Besides editing a volume, Comparative Constitutionalism in South Asia, Vikram has also edited and introduced George Gadboise's long lost classic, Supreme Court of India, The Beginnings. Vikram maintains an active private interest in Indian history and constitutional law. He and his friends co-founded Law and Other Things, India's first legal blog, which focuses on understanding the constitution, courts and legal system. He is presently working on a book about how India became a republic in 1950. He will be speaking entirely in his personal capacity in today's lecture. Let us welcome Mr. Vikram Raghavan with a huge round of applause. Welcome. I invite Mr. Vikram Raghavan, Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor C. Rajkumar and Professor Sudarshan to please offer the floral tribute and commence today's lecture with the lighting of the lamp. Thank you very much. I invite Professor C. Rajkumar, Founding Vice-Chancellor, O.P. Jinder Global University, to please present the welcome address. A very good morning to all of you. Uh, it's an absolute uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, for us to be able to uh, host the Granville Austin Memorial Lecture. Uh, by my very dear friend, um, Vikram Raghavan. Uh, it's also a very special moment uh, for us uh, to be able to host this lecture because besides his outstanding uh, credentials as a scholar, a researcher, uh, a remarkable individual, Vikram is also uh, the biographer of Granville Austin. Uh, for all the students who are present here, uh, and I'm sure Vikram will touch this aspect in the course of his lecture, uh, Granville Austin is somebody who uh, inspired uh, generations of Indian legal scholars, historians, researchers, parliamentarians and others who wanted to understand uh, the evolution of Indian constitution. And the, such was Granville Austin's uh, uh, influential work, uh, beginning with his first book on Indian constitution, Cornerstone of the, of the, Cornerstone of the Nation, and followed by a book later he wrote on um, uh, the idea of uh, working a democratic constitution, the Indian experience, uh, it was remarkable for a man uh, to be able to navigate the entire 
constitutional making process and to very, very meticulously, rigorously, uh, in an evidence-based manner, uh, document all of that uh, in the form of that book. So uh, we decided uh, some years ago to institute and uh, endo a lecture in the memory of Granville Austin. I had the privilege to meet um, Dr. Austin when I was a student initially in Delhi University, uh, the Campus Law Center, um, uh, when he came for the book launch. But uh, more importantly for me personally, when I was a student at Harvard Law School, I had the opportunity to meet him and invite him for um, a conference that we hosted in April 2000 on human rights and Indian judiciary's constitutional jurisprudence. I specifically want to thank uh, my friend uh, Vikram for accepting our invitation to be here uh, amidst many of his uh, uh, important assignments in India, uh, uh, not just in Delhi, but also in other parts of India. Uh, Vikram, as, as I told to a bunch of my colleagues shortly before, uh, he has been a great source of inspiration for me personally, not just now, but long ago. When I was a student in the year 1994 at Campus Law Center, Delhi University, Vikram was at the same time a student of the National Law School of India, University of Bangalore. And I had the privilege to visit NLS Bangalore uh, as a part of a research project that we were undertaking on protecting local communities, their resources and the environment, uh, where Professor N.R. Madhav Menon launched that project with a view to, uh, you know, uh, infusing social values in law and advocacy. And I was part of a group of young lawyers, law students from Delhi University visiting. And that's when I met Vikram for the first time. He was already a renowned young scholar, a student scholar, a researcher, and uh, later he um, moved to NYU and he got the Hauser Global Scholarship and persuaded, uh, pursued his LLM program at NYU, uh, following which he worked at one of uh, 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 America's leading law firms known as uh, O. Melvinian and Myers, where he achieved distinction. Uh, used to, I used to know him uh, when I was also in New York, but a good part of his uh, career, uh, he has been working in international organizations, and that's been part of his journey. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, besides being uh, an amazing lawyer, uh, Vikram has also uh, you know, fulfilled his own passionate interest in research, writing, as well as uh, being a scholar. Uh, he is one of uh, the most distinguished public intellectual. Uh, he has been actively writing on some of the big issues of our time, uh, as well as uh, he's one of those individuals who, um, you know, all of us in the world of academia or outside, we end up getting bracketed. So, for example, you are either a human rights person or a corporate person or a commercial law person uh, or a trade law person. But uh, Vikram is one of those rare individuals who has uh, straddled across multiple worlds. And so because of that professional uh, you know, uh, journeys that he has undertaken uh, across different worlds, his own academic and research interest also is across multiple worlds. Um, he has been actively engaged in the public law discourse uh, while writing and researching on a range of issues surrounding public law but on constitutional law and issues surrounding it. But he also has done some phenomenal pioneering work in other aspects of law. Uh, as some of you may or may not remember, one of his early works is uh, on telecommunication law, something at that time nobody would have dared to write or for that matter had enough information to write. And of course, more recently, he's been uh, so much interested in constitutional histories, uh, history of uh, individuals who shaped the development of institutions, including the Supreme Court of India. And um, all of that, he does it as, a, as an aside from his regular job. So uh, I am deeply grateful to Mr. Vikram Raghavan for accepting our invitation to deliver the Granville Austin Memorial Lecture. Vikram, I should tell you that uh, this auditorium was uh, undertaken in a record speed. Uh, we completely revamped this auditorium in the last uh, uh, 30 days uh, so that it is available for uh, your event. So this will be the first event that we are hosting in this uh, newly renovated uh, global auditorium. So we are also very, it augurs well for us to begin this uh, new journey in this new uh, forum 
uh, with the Granville Austin Memorial Lecture uh, on the theme uh, that Vikram himself has chosen, which is about Granville Austin and transformative constitutionalism. I also want to thank Professor Sudarshan, the Dean of the Tyndall School of Government and Public Policy, who has so kindly accepted our invitation to uh, reflect on the work of Granville Austin, but also connected to Vikram's own uh, interests, but also to sh share some special moments uh, about the journeys and evolution of uh, Granville Austin himself. I also want to thank my colleague uh, and uh, friend, Professor Srijit, and uh, other assistant deans and associate deans of the Jindal Global Law School for um, working very hard in the last several weeks to put together this um, uh, very distinguished lecture. Uh, I know that students uh, who are here listening to this lecture, but also others who are listening to this lecture through the YouTube uh, live that is happening as uh, right now, uh, will be immensely benefited by what Vikram is going to speak, but also to be able to recognize the interdisciplinary engagement of law and what Granville Austin has done through his seminal works is to long before many of us, especially in the world of law, have recognized the role of interdisciplinarity and uh, indeed, uh, especially history, but also other disciplines in shaping the evolution of law, such was the impact of the work of Granville Austin. We are very fortunate that we have been able to institute this lecture. I believe, uh, and what Vikram told me recently is that we have also got the um, uh, endorsement and indeed the blessings of the family members of uh, Dr. Granville Austin uh, as we embark on this journey today. So thank you very much for your presence uh, and uh, I look forward to the lecture itself and I sincerely hope that you will all uh, enjoy what you are going to hear but also actively participate in the Q&A session which will be followed by the lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such a heartwarming welcome and introduction to Mr. Raghavan. And sir, we are very fortunate to have you amidst us today. I now request Professor S.G. Srijit, Executive Dean, Jindal Global Law School, to please share the introductory remarks. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to give the introductory remarks. Uh, in this lecture, the distinguished lecture in honor of uh, Professor Granville Austin to be delivered by Mr. Vikram Raghavan. I'll reflect a little bit on this theme, transformative constitutionalism. It can mean two things. One is the Constitution's ability to transform the society. And second is the ability of the Constitution itself to stay time transcending, to ability to transform itself. In a movie, with honors, the protagonist asks a question, what is the particular genius of the Constitution? Well, this is in the context of American Constitution. And he gets a response that the genius of the Constitution is that it can always be changed. The genius of the Constitution is that it makes no permanent rule other than its faith in the wisdom of the ordinary people to govern themselves. And he continues. Our founding fathers were great men, ne, women too. And they knew what all great men, ne, women, should know. That they did not know everything and left a way for us to change this. So inspired by this particular dialogue, I asked this question, what is that particular genius of the Indian constitution? And the response is that Indian constitution has the ability to transcend the time. It's a time transcending constitution. That means the ability to stay relevant no matter whatever temporal changes happen. No matter the tempest of the time, the avalanches of the change, the tectonic shifts in the society, the Indian com constitution emerges safe like that proverbial ship, though weather beaten, emerging from the turbulence. And then everything around us falls down the Indian constitution has the remarkable ability to become the Noah's Ark, safeguarding us within its iron walls. But still the question stacks, why the Indian constitution is time transcending? 
Because Indian constitution is not really a set of time-fixated commandments, which will keep us within a strange, mysterious time loop. Rather, Indian constitution has an epistemological purpose. I remember the statements of Madhav Khosla in his book, The Founding uh, Moments of Indian Constitution, that Indian constitution is a continuing education in democratic values. Let me uh, try to respond to this question further within the five minutes generously bestowed upon me by the organizers by way of an imagery. This imagery is presented by Italo Calvino in his novel, The Castle of Crossed Destinies. There is a castle where the travelers meet, but the moment you enter the castle, you will be deprived of your ability to speak. You have no power of speech. You will be given a pile of tarot cards. Using the tarot cards, you have to communicate with each of them. Each member arranges the tarot card in a certain sequential order, and their life story is formed. You change the sequential order, yet another life story will be formed. So you change the order, you change the sequence, you get a different story. But then what we have to understand is that Indian constitution has this kind of same semiotic power as these tarot cards in Italo Calvino's The Castle of, Castle of Crossed Destinies. The Indian constitution, when I say it has the same semiotic power, what I mean is that Indian constitution does not speak one reality. It gives us the opportunity to create our own realities within the values of the democracy. It's like the tarot card. There are many moments in the Indian constitution. Each clause of the constitution is our story. Spinning it in a certain way, we can create our own realities. So taken in isolation, each tarot card in the novel in question is in fact a social context. It's a social context. And we have to leave these contexts by enlivening our own identities there. As the sequences changes, the life's pattern changes. As the order changes, the life's pattern again changes. Anyway, as the pile of the tarot has the story of everybody who came to that castle, in the same manner, the Indian constitution has all our stories included in that. We just need to go and discover that story. Hence, we call the Indian constitution a living constitution. I conclude here by quoting Alfred Tennyson's The Brook. But I'm going to make some adaptations here. I chatter and chatter as I flow. I chatter and chatter as I flow. The Constitution keeps on whispering every moment the democratic values to our ears. I chatter and chatter as I flow to join the brimming river. The brimming river actually, you know, is joining actually in the eternity of the humanity. Indian Constitution will stay here until humanity stays on the surface of the earth. From four, men may come and men may go. Nay, people may come and people may go, but I go on forever. I believe that's why I have an introduction for the larger scheme of things to follow. I'm too small in this big scheme of things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Srijit, for that very insightful remarks. I now invite Professor R. Sudarshan, Dean, Jindal School of Government and Public Policy, to please share his reflections on the contributions of Dr. Granville Austin. Uh, thank you very much, Surabhi. I'm, I'm particularly delighted to be here. Firstly, because just the other day, this auditorium was a complete mess um, two days ago. And so I'm absolutely amazed that it's so beautiful and orderly and this is the first event that we are having in this renovated auditorium and um, it's therefore very fitting that a dear friend Vikram Raghavan um, begins uh, his uh, the auditorium's new session of what we hope would be many such events uh, of uh, you know intellectual uh, quality um, I, I'm particularly touched that uh, the Vice Chancellor decided to institute uh, the Granville Austin Memorial Lecture uh, because I knew, uh, got to know Granville Austin. Um, I won't go into how, uh, but I was um, uh, in Oxford uh, on a Rhodes Scholarship figuring out what to do. Uh, I'd done my MA in Economics in the Delhi School of Economics. It's quite a rigorous, highly theoretical 
program, uh, and I wanted a break from economics. Uh, so I was looking around to see what I might do. I knew I had a scholarship, so I spent the first year uh, doing philosophy and gradually got interested in law because one of my tutors in the philosophy of law was Joseph Raz, uh, who was a remarkable intellectual. Uh, and then I decided I will do a master's uh, in politics. Um, and at that time, I was trying to figure out, you know, what, what would I write my MA thesis on. And I was introduced to uh, Dr. Kamal Hussein, was then a fellow at Nafil College. He had to flee uh, Bangladesh because Sheikh uh, Mujbir Rahman had been assassinated. And at that time, uh, Kamal Hussein was the foreign minister of Bangladesh. He was also played a big part in drafting the constitution of uh, independent Bangladesh. So I was talking to him, and, and he suggested to me that I read Granville Austin's uh, book on the cornerstone of a nation and write my uh, dissertation for the MPhil uh, on amendments that happened after Granville Austin's great account of the, f you know, how the Constitution was founded. Uh, Kamal Hussein also said to me, you have another choice. You could read Granville Austin or you could read about 17 volumes of Mr. Shivarov on the framing of the Constitution. And, and so that was a forbidding task. And so we found this excellent account um, of, um, you know, a story about how the Constitution got framed. Now, um, it's, it's remarkable that um, uh, it's, um, it's such an accessible account. And, and I went on to uh, then um, do a, a seminar in Oxford with, um, um, of course, Joseph Raz, uh, but also John Finnis, and uh, Ronald Walken, um, and we invited Justices Bhagavati and Krishna Iyer uh, to come to that seminar uh, and discuss uh, a couple of their judgments in the Supreme Court. I, I said to, uh, Professor Hart was also there, I said, you know, law students in Oxford seem, only seem to be uh, looking at what the law lords have said or what the United States Supreme Court has said, and they don't study what uh, Indian judges have done, and they are among the more uh, innovative and creative uh, judges uh, because the Constitution of India creates uh, one of the most powerful judiciaries in the world. Uh, the Constitution says the law laid down by the Supreme Court shall be the law of the land alongside what Parliament might enact or state legislators might enact. It gives the Supreme Court the power to do complete justice which means you, know, you don't have to necessarily be bound by what is argued before you um, as, as judges. Um, it also has, uh, uh, the high courts of India have always had the prerogative writs, uh, which in fact the high courts applied during the emergency and uh, the Supreme Court then went by the letter of the law uh, at that time, Article 359, uh, and said the president has suspended fundamental rights, we can't help you. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, the senior Chandrachud. Uh, fortunately, the junior Chandrachud in Putuswami more recently overturned that, uh, that ruling in ADM Jabalpur and, um, and, you know, the, in ADM and said that this, must, this ruling must be buried 10 fathoms deep. I'm not quite sure about that because, you know, the Article 359 has been amended. It only omits 19 and 21, um, and still requires that it be followed uh, in a subsequent case of any declaration of emergency. Now that apart, what inspired me was that this was such a wonderful, accessible account of uh, founding. So I'm very grateful to Dr. Kamal Hussain, uh, who introduced me uh, to this book and to the idea that uh, amendments to the Constitution of India are worth following and studying in earnest. And therefore, I felt that I should do that, so I began work on it. I didn't publish my work, but uh, after I came in contact with uh, uh, Red Austin, uh, I was able to share with him uh, a lot of my uh, notes and findings, and, uh, and we had many, many long discussions. 
Um, and it's very gratifying that, you know, he, he, he's been criticized, um, especially by Professor Upendra Bakshi, for, for being, you know, what is he kind of thing. You know, if the uh, Vikram would say a little more about it, I'm sure. But it's not for nothing that, you know, judges of the Supreme Court um, down the line um, have uh, cited him, especially on this very vexed question that we had about fundamental rights and uh, directive principles. Austin actually, on the chapter dealing with directive principles, calls it fundamental rights too. He doesn't title it directive principles because he was really convinced that the two parts of the Constitution, uh, which he called the conscience of the Constitution, uh, went together. And, and of course, you know, he knows that uh, the division between uh, fundamental rights directive principles was influenced by Isaiah Berlin's two concepts of liberty, um, where you, know, you call something a right if there is an enforceable remedy, and if you have some rights that can only be realized progressively without an immediate remedy, then you'd rather not call it a right. That's uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin's view. Uh, that somehow came into uh, our Constitution as well, but um, the Red Austin believed that, that together uh, they spoke, they were the soul of the Constitution of India. And, and so there's been, on those judgments, dealing with uh, the fundamental rights directive principles and their interrelationships, judges have quoted uh, Austin in extenso. Um, in, um, uh, they have quoted him uh, in the state of Rajasthan uh, on federalism. In fact, the phrase which uh, the current government uses, cooperative federalism, is uh, something that uh, Austin refers to. I mean, but he's always uh, a meticulous scholar. He always gives you a source. So he doesn't say, I invented cooperative federalism. He'll say there was an author called A.H. Birch uh, who wrote about the uh, federalism in the United States and Australia. Who used that phrase? And it, it's better than uh, Weir or somebody else calling it quasi-federal or federal in, you know, in theory, but unitary in practice and so on. So therefore, it's understandable why you know, judges would find this uh, accessible. And it's also important because it, you know, otherwise you know, our constitution could have been read as an updated version of the Government of India Act of 1935. Uh, unfortunately, in many respects, our constitution is incomplete. Uh, for instance, on the powers of the role of the governor, the, in the assembly, they had decided that they will have a schedule replicating the instrument of instructions that the British had for their governors, but changing it so that the governors in India, in independent India, would not be partisan and would not be political, would be independent in that respect, and be, give sage and wise advice um, to the government of the states. And, and therefore, they were given a sort of a code of conduct. But that never got incorporated in the Constitution. With the result, there's a, we pretty much have the same provisions that uh, the Government of India Act of 1935 had with respect to its governors. And it creates problems, as we know. So in many respects, you know, the task of constitution making couldn't be finished uh, in the time that they had. But you needed someone like, like uh, Austin, um, who you know, comes to the subject as a PhD scholar. Um, I mean, you know, he, I, he may have been interested in India earlier in his younger life. I don't know what prompted him to do that. But then here is a narrative that kind of holds. I mean, the book in itself is a seamless web, uh, which is a phrase he uses to describe the, the Constitution. But this inspired me. Uh, and later, I was very fortunate to spend many hours with him, as I mentioned. But one of the things we did in Oxford at that time was produce a fast shrift for Justice V.R. Krishna here. It's called Judges and the Judicial Power. Some of you might find it in the library. It's a nice collection. It's got articles by Lord Denning, Lord Scarman, uh, Archibald Cox, who was the special prosecutor for Watergate. Um, uh, Rajiv Dhawan, Salman Kurshid, and I edited it. And that is a consequence of that seminar that I mentioned that we had organized. So I look forward to. Uh, Vikram's uh, uh, more detailed uh, enunciation of uh, 
why Granville Austin remains relevant and important. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sudarshan, for that. Um, uh, you know, with kind of, sometimes we forget how these beginnings happened. I just uh, was able to track down an email. Uh, in the year 2014, uh, Randall Austin had died, and uh, uh, the news came to us. And uh, Sudarshan sends me an email. Um, on 8th July 2014, saying that, for your information, Maybe we should institute a memorial lecture in the name of Granville Austin. And um, now, of course, I replied saying, yes, we will indeed. But then Sudarshan sends a uh, message to Nancy, uh, who is Austin's wife, and I'm going to read that message. It says, uh, Biju Rao has shared with me your email address, and Vikram conveyed to me the saddening news of the passing away of Red. You have been Red's alter ego. You are with us, and so Red remains with us, and we can pray that he may live long with us in that way. So let the bell toll. We know it tolls for us, and meanwhile, we can fondly remember the wonderfully lovely human being we have been fortunate to have known. May God give you and your daughters all strength. Red will be able to intercede on our behalf with divinity better than he could before. Lots of love, Sudarshan. With those words, I'm going to invite Mr. Vikram Raghavan to deliver the Granville Austin Memorial Lecture. Hi, um, it's a great honor for me to deliver the Granville Austin Memorial Lecture. I thank uh, Vice Chancellor Dr. C. Rajkumar, who I've known for more than three decades for having given me this privilege. Um, it's been 13 years since I've uh, been on this campus, and the change, of course, is beyond belief, including this uh, room, which I understand was constructed in record time. So it's obviously change that's still galloping and ongoing. Um, and I know how hard it is to pull this off, because uh, I was a skeptic of Jindal, of the project that this would work, that we could build a private institution uh, that would be a global school of excellence, given how hard it is to establish institutions in India. But I've been proved wrong, and I freely admit it. And uh, the tribute must go to the vice chancellor, but to the faculty and all of you. Um, there is a, another connection between the school and the subject of today's lecture, which is um, I first met um, Granville Austin at Harvard Law School um, at this um, conference that uh, Rajkumar mentioned, uh, which was actually organized by him when he wasn't a professor. He was a law student, like the rest of you. He even had his own phone number, uh, <laughs> which is obviously not his anymore. And I must acknowledge also Pratibha Jain, his partner, uh, and crime in this uh, uh, partner in crime uh, in this uh, in this venture and many more other things. Right? Uh, she's not here with us today, but uh, uh, this was the place I met Austin. And so, even though Austin um, is not mentioned, this was the announcement in the Harvard Crimson newspaper about this conference, which you know was a conference um, that uh, took place, which you know involved the. Uh, sort of um, the existing uh, attorney general and law minister, but also had a lot of these dignitaries, judges, and Granville Austin, who came up from Washington, uh, where I then moved to uh, a few uh, months or probably a year after the conference. 
And uh, I stayed in touch with um, uh, Red and Nancy Austin. He was called Red because his hair was red when he grew up. Of course, later it became white, but you know, the um, uniqueness of a red-haired person, which charmed and beguiled many people, especially in India, uh, was something that he bore with pride. Um, but it was only after Austin's passing in 2014 that I developed a deeper understanding of the man as a resilient researcher, insightful scholar, and a devoted family man. Now, there are two factors for this phenomenon. First, I had privileged access to most of Austin's papers, his files, his correspondence, before they were shipped off to where they are now, which is Princeton University. Second, I gained a deeper understanding of both Red and Nancy through my conversations with their family, particularly their daughter, Hilary Austin. Uh, and in this lecture, I will draw on these and other streams of sharing, learning, and discussions, particularly with Parv Tyagi, who is a law student like all of you, uh, who helped me prepare today's lecture and whom I want to acknowledge. Um, as the Republic, our Republic's first historian, Austin offers an authoritative, engaging, and difficult to eclipse account of India's founding, or as some would suggest more modestly, the framing of our Constitution. Indeed, most scholars and commentators would probably agree that Austin's book, The Indian Constitution, The Cornerstone of a Nation, shaped the dominant, and until today, largely multi-partisan, across the political spectrum, telling of our republic's creation story, how it was born and how it came into being. That is not to say that this book is without flaws, without missteps and exclusions. Like anything of its time, you know, error is prone, judgments you know, are based on what you know then. Uh, you put something into a book, you deliberately exclude other things, and there are judgments to be made. So Austin's work, therefore, is subject to a lot of comment, review, and considerable criticism. And in this lecture, I don't propose to revisit and survey those assessments, although obviously I have to acknowledge they exist. And I invite you to read my friend Arvind Dilangovan's uh, article on the national narrative of the telling, where he also recognizes Professor Shorbani Sen's work uh, on, on this subject. In this lecture, though, I want to argue instead something different, that Austin was among the first commentators to proclaim that our Constitution is a radical, revolutionary, and social document. Radical. He kept saying that all the time, right? Um, and this is a sentiment, of course, he picked up early. And he picked this up from his conversations with members of the Constituent Assembly, people who were still alive at the time he came to Delhi in 1960, with whom he met, who he sort of traced down, tracked down, forced himself uh, to get a meeting with, and gained their confidence, uh, and uh, interviewed them. So uh, as I, um, and in this respect, therefore, Austin was a forerunner or prophet, um, like Upendra Bakshi decades later, for what we broadly understand to be transformative constitutionalism, which I'm sure all of you have heard uh, in courses, right? But as I will explain, there are key differences between Austin's thesis of the Constitution being a social document and the definitions, methods, and controversies surrounding contemporary understandings of transformative constitutionalism. Now, in his second book, um, Working a Democratic Constitution, Austin placed the um, social revolution, the fact that the Constitution is supposed to inst instigate a social revolution within what he called a seamless web, together with national unity um, and democracy. In fact, I found in your vice chancellor's office a copy uh, of this book, and it is special because it's actually autographed by Austin. So you better keep it safely, uh, because some people might be looking for it. But obviously, it's available uh, on, lib I mean, on lots of websites uh, that are <laughs> open to the general public. It is a common resource that everyone should have, either on their bookshelf or their laptop. Um, so in this book, um, Austin admitted that this book, as um, Sudarshan was explaining, was written 25 years later after the first book, which he wrote when he was just a little older than those of you who are in the room. 
Um, and uh, so he came back to write this book sort of in middle age or close, you know, towards the later stage of his life. But he admitted that in constitutional practice over five decades, democracy had been subordinate in the name of social revolution. So it's not like he walked back this idea that the Constitution is a radical social document. He nuanced that message, which I will come to. Okay? So um, to recollect Austin's work, though, we must understand his life. Who was he? Uh, and uh, uh, why did he come to write this book? What were the intellectual influences? Should we dim the lights a bit? or? Uh, yeah, okay. I don't know if it gives them a headache. Or, okay. Um, so I have offered a basic outline of the key milestones and events in Austin's life. And obviously, I draw um, from some work that I've done previously on this subject, which you can, you can find online. I've also spoken on this topic a couple of times, and uh, those recordings are on YouTube. But today, I want to offer a few additional details that were not available to me previously. Uh, particularly the intellectual influences on Austin and the so-called missing middle. He had disappeared. Professor Bakshi called him Rip Van Winkle. What had happened between writing these books? I try to answer that mystery for you today. So let's begin at the beginning. Austin is born in 1927. He grows up in this small town called Norwich, which is right there in the top of the United States, close to the Canadian border, very cold lots of skiing. So he, uh, like Swami and his friends in Malgudi Tays, Austin and his band of buddies, uh, you know, their only indulgences were milkshakes and skiing because they also grew up in the Great Depression. Um, and so Austin had a somewhat austere childhood in that sense. And he's written about this in a book that he wrote close to the end of his life, uh, which I urge you to read. Uh, now, in 1946, Austin goes across the river from Norwich to um, Dartmouth College, which is in New Hampshire. It's a liberal arts degree that he pursues. And uh, among other things, obviously, Austin was, uh, you know, a sportsman. Um, and uh, he had, you know, more friends and buddies that he made at Dartmouth. He graduated in 1950. This is the first time I think I'm showing this photo because I only found it two days ago. Um, this, I think, is of his graduation, and he has that look that all of you will have <laughs> when you don your graduation cap, right? Strange look to be in this uh, uh, <laughs> unusual um, uh, attire. But continents away, of course, India's Constituent Assembly had just completed its labors, and the Constitution had been signed and came into force. Now, it's unclear to me whether Austin took note of it, right, because uh, this is the year he graduated. Presumably, he read the newspapers. But um, it does not appear that he was particularly interested in India at this point, at least from what I know so far. Instead, he decided to go see the world. And, uh, you know, his first port of call was Europe. Uh, he went around the world. Um, and uh, he was a journalist for various uh, uh, newspapers and outlets that we don't really know of today, or they don't exist. But for the first few, of his life, few years of his life, he was a wanderer and sort of got a peripatetic knowledge of the world as it existed uh, in practice, right, rather than theory. And he then decided to apply for a sort of real job, if you will, or a job behind a desk. Uh, which he got, which was the United States uh, Information Service. Uh, those of you know who have frequented the American Center here or in other Indian cities, uh, in the embassy and in the consulates, there is a uh, USIS office which serves uh, as a library. They give you uh, career counseling, whatever. Um, they are uh, all over the world, and Austin joined the USIS in Saigon, uh, which was then in uh, sort of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, in Vietnam, and uh, the sort of war was just, uh, it, the war hadn't started, but obviously there were rumblings of it. So Austin worked here, and he also then moved to Beirut again with the USIS uh, to work in Lebanon, very different setting. And uh, I've often wondered, uh, actually more recently wondered, whether these two jobs actually influenced him, because in both countries there was civil war and political strife brewing, right? So maybe that also 
uh, was at the back of his mind in his later work. So that's something I just want to put out there. But this posting in Lebanon is interesting because he works with an ambassador who says, well, young man, you need to go and get some more study. And uh, so he's urged to go and get a PhD. And uh, he, at the same time, though, uh, makes his first Indian friends. There is this uh, military attache uh, to the embassy in Egypt, which is accredited to Lebanon, who he meets. And so it's really in Lebanon uh, that he makes his first Indian friends. And perhaps them, uh, but also his wife, who he marries uh, around the same time, uh, uh, sort of instigate him to go on to study history, but South Asian history. Uh, and uh, Austin sort of you know, decides, OK, my wandering around the world is enough. Let me go back to school. And uh, he enrolls in 1959 for a PhD in South Asian studies at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. Now, at Oxford, Austin has two mentor, mentors. The first is this guy called Colin Cuthbert Davies. Uh, he's written a variety of books that are sort of somewhat academic at this point. Um, but he was obviously one of Austin's influences. Uh, he was very interested in the idea of the Commonwealth. In fact, interestingly, uh, he was first um, a, um, uh, a reader of uh, um, uh, Indian history. But before that, he was at the LSE. The second person who I understand to be Austin's PhD guide, I don't have a photo. Uh, I wrote to Oxford's archives. I wrote to Exeter's archives. I tried to look on genealogy. Uh, if you have one, please send it to me. All I have is a photo of a book with his name. But he was very influential because this guy, Francis Carnell, the other intellectual influence on Austin, was a lecturer uh, at the Commonwealth Institute in Oxford. And he was particularly interested in East Asia, having worked on the Malayan constitution. But his students studied emerging constitutions from around the world in the newly decolonized countries, right? This is the 60s. Countries across Africa and Asia are rapidly decolonizing, right? There are flags of independence uh, sort of uh, being unfurled. Uh, Africa has suddenly 28 new countries, right, in the first few years of the 1960s. So this creates a lot of interest, excitement in Oxford, the colonial sort of knowledge center of the world. And so uh, Carnell is uh, dispatching his students to study the making of new constitutions in all these newly independent countries, right? And so Austin signs up to go to India. Uh, now, who pushed him there? I don't really know. Uh, but he signs up to study Indian constitutional design under Carnell in Oxford. But obviously, this study can't be done only in Oxford. He has to go to India. And so he does. He arrives in 1960, August 1960. The heat is as it is today, searing with no air conditioning. And so he lands one very tired, sweaty night in Delhi. This is uh, the verbatim account of his arrival in Delhi and making his way through the taxis to a hotel, which was you know, in some place that he couldn't really describe. But it's fascinating. This shows you how beautiful of a writer he was, because he could vividly describe, as if you can experience it today, what it was like. But um, we have to move on to what Austin really came to do, which is that he came to study the making of our Constitution, for which, as we know, we had uh, debates. Uh, I guess that slide got missed. We had the debates, right? Uh, we had the published volumes. but. Um, what was missing were the files, the actual documents about uh, why a provision was drafted in a certain way, the minutes of all the committees. And so for this, Austin really didn't get this is a blank screen. Uh, it was not deliberate, but it does show you the fact that he really got a, drew a blank in a sense that the Babudam, I've called my obituary to Austin on scroll, which you can read uh, for those of you looking at your phones. Do Google my name and Austin, and you might actually find that article interesting. That article says that in the early days of Austin's arrival in Delhi, he made no headway because nobody was, uh, was uh, offering to give him access to the files on the making of the Constitution. So somebody suggested to him, well, if they're not showing you the files and you're drawing a blank, then maybe you should go speak to the people who were involved in the exercise. So that's what he does. He makes a list of all the people he needs to see. 
and he starts calling them one by one. Now, he had this beautiful accent, which was a bit fake because he was an American, but with a name like Granville Austin, and you say, you know, you just have to just have a slight intonation, and people take you seriously, as you know, in this country. Uh, and uh, that's what got him a lot of these interviews. Now, of course, other people introduced him, but he was really trying to understand what went on in the assembly, in the minds of the assembly mem uh, members, but also among the leaders, right? And so for this, like I said, he had the debates, but you have to go behind the debates to the volumes that, uh, of Shivarao, which uh, Sudarshan talked about, where the debates are put in the context of all the background deliberations that are taking place, the meetings, the committee meetings, the discussions uh, between Patel, between Nehru, between uh, Ambedkar, right, on the uh, compromises, the wording of clauses in the Constitution. So one of the people he meets is K. M. Munshi, uh, some of you, sort of a um, not so well-known figure, although he deserves greater importance, one of the key non-Congress members of the Assembly. He had walked away from the Congress party. You can Google why. Uh, and he was someone who met Austin early and helped Austin a lot. So here you see a letter from K. M. Munshi saying, I have given you permission to look at all the papers in my files and microfilm them and a certificate just in case anyone asks you later. Okay. Um, now, what is very interesting is that uh, Austin went to see other people as well, uh, but he also decided to write the prime minister. This is like today tweeting Modi, my Indigo car has, bus has not come and I'm stuck, right? This toilet is not working, people tweet the railway minister, right? Something like that, right? It's a a long shot. I Let me write to the Prime Minister to see if he can help this young graduate student. But look at the beauty of this letter. I'm an American doing research in India, right? I dislike having to disturb you, the Prime Minister of India, as busy as you are, but I have waited to the last minute. I cannot access certain documents, right? This is a letter that Nehru receives and then apparently says, help this man. So the National Archives gets the message and some some documents available to Austin. But the big break really comes when Austin goes for this very remarkable meeting. Again, invites himself to tea or gets invited with the president, Rajendra Prasad, right? Here's the actual copy of the letter, right? So according to Austin, they both sit cross-legged on the floor in Rashtrapati Bhavan informally. And Austin, the red-haired Austin, convinces Babu Rajendra Prasad to set him see the papers, but also borrow them. You know, I used to always think this was a story that Austin invented because in his letters he claimed that he impressed Prasad so much that Prasad let him take all these papers. There was no photocopying shop. So there was no Xeroxing, but they had to be microfilmed, which is a technology where basically you copy, uh, you take a photo like you do today, but in a different technology of the actual document, right? But yet the idea that you could walk out of Rashtrapati Bhavan <laughs> with the president's files seems rather, uh, let's say, in, you know, daring, to put it mildly. So I thought this was largely made up until I found last night the note from the president's secretary acknowledging Austin knew somebody would ask this question, and he had the guy on Government of India letterhead, I'm not going to show that letter, basically saying, it is true, Rajendra Prasad allowed you to borrow it, it is true you copied it, and it's true you returned it. Right? So I say this is the greatest... Uh, sort of act of researchmanship. Even today, I challenge people to do that. But we must move on, which is Austin decided to bring his family, right? Until now, he was coming on these solo trips, but he now had four kids. And so it's difficult to basically sort of live transcontinentally. So he brings his family, moves them to Delhi. Lots of things happen. They go to Pushkar, Pushkar Pahalgam. They celebrate Holi. But they are also in Delhi in May 1964. That fateful day, the 27th of May 1964, when the news comes that Nehru has passed away. So Austin makes his way with the thousands to Teen Murti, and the next day, the parents hold the children on their shoulders to watch the funeral procession go by. And that sentiment is captured in this beautiful letter, which has gone viral on Twitter. You can just look, at, look for it on Twitter, all of those who are following me on Twitter. I can see that, no, I'm joking. Uh, but if you are, do look at this uh, letter. Uh, it is a letter that is not a, this is not a letter praising or worshipping Nehru. This is a letter really describing the sentiment in Delhi, in India, in a very dispassionate way. It's almost poetic the way he 
describes what he had seen and observed in those two days in Delhi, but the larger significance of the passing of Nehru. Right? But it is also true that with the passing of Nehru, there was a question in Austin's mind, as there was in the mind of many Indians and commentators on India, about whether the republic would endure after Nehru. Right? And so for Austin, this was an existentialist moment. Can he do the PhD, the study of the making of a constitution whose pri uh, of a republic whose prime minister had lived for 17 years and now is suddenly gone, and what would happen after him? In fact, there was a book by another American his age called After Nehru Who? And uh, this is basically uh, what happened, which is uh, Shastri was elected by the Congress uh, power brokers of the time. So there was constitutional continuity. We know that. And this, of course, reassured Austin, but also the 1965 war. Why? Because during the 65 war, Austin was surprised, like, unlike other countries where the military took over, martial law was proclaimed when there was a hostility in India, the civilians took the military decisions, right? Or at least they were responsible uh, for the leadership of the war, and there were no troops running the government, right? So these two developments convinced him that the founders of the republic had chosen wisely and democracy through the constitution would endure. The constitution had survived its first stress test. Now, we must move on, which is that Austin then goes back to Oxford. He completes his PhD thesis. He chooses the unusual name, Tryst with Destiny. Obviously, that's a somewhat of an overused name. So he is uh, advised to change it to Cornerstone. So what is Cornerstone, or the Gospel of Cornerstone, as Upendra Bakshi somewhat, uh, let's say, half sarcastically but half in good humor describes it, right? Um, there are many parts of it, right? Here's the official version of Cornerstone, which you don't see often because this is the first edition. The Indian edition only comes out in 72. This is the 66 sort of OUP English edition. But Cornerstone is many things, right? But at the end of the day, Cornerstone is a great drama, right? Uh, it is a series of events of following people, of what was happening in the assembly, but according to themes, right? Um, Sudarshan mentioned the fundamental rights. So Austin describes the background and the circumstances in which the Constituent Assembly was debating the Constitution, making the Constitution, drafting the fundamental rights. He has this beautiful phrase, the fundamental rights were framed in the midst of fundamental wrongs. What does he mean? What did he mean by that? It is that there was great carnage. There was uh, violence of in unspeakable proportions. Uh, there was burning and looting in the streets. Members in the assembly could smell the fires outside. They needed curfew passes to come in while they were debating the fundamental rights. So obviously, that impacted the way uh, they reacted to these developments. And Austin sort of makes these connections between how the Constitution came into being, but the conditions prevailing in Delhi and in the country at, a, at large, right? So um, this, in fact, there's actually a recent essay which I found uh, while preparing for this talk called The, Pri the uh, Prejudice and Passion in the Assembly According to Cornerstone. And he's, this guy, uh, Vatsal Naresh, says that there was so much passion in the Assembly that some people had sort of lost their sense of ju judgment. Now, I don't know if that's true, uh, but it's very interesting to see uh, that Cornerstone, in a way, gives you that sense of not just what was happening in the assembly, but outside, and that obviously impacting the inside. Now, we move on, which is that Cornerstone, there's many other things we don't have time to describe. I can spend three days sort of you know, unpacking Cornerstone, but it does create and etch many memories, many myths about India's creation story, we don't have time to discuss them, but there are lots of new, younger scholars who are looking at Austin respectfully, critically, with skepticism, with, with uh, let's say, awe. And I think it's, it's good to follow all of that. But I want to focus instead on Cornerstone's most controversial sentence. There's one sentence with Prime Minister Modi also quoted in Parliament that Austin has in Cornerstone, which is, that the Indian Constitution is first and foremost a social document. Now, Austin prepares us for this claim in his lucid introduction to Cornerstone, which should be read. He says three things. The Constitution was to foster the achievement of many goals. Transcendental among them was that of the social revolution. He then says this resolution, revolution would bring about fundamental changes in the structure of Indian society. And 
that the theme of the social revolution runs throughout the proceedings. So this is a fascinating thing, right? This is, he says in his introduction. So if you want to talk about who is a transformatist, transformativist, who is a person who's right, ask, you know, arguing that the Constitution is a radical document, here is the evidence, right? In the opening sentences of Cornerstone. But he moved on. So look at, for instance, he says, look at this is the uh, sort of the contents of our Constitution, right? The, the first page of the uh, uh, sort of the, the, the outline. Uh, of the theme of the chapter, then he says this entire scheme is infected by the idea of a social revolution. How? For that, he basically says that the Constitution really has three animating principles. First, the idea of the social revolution, and he says there's direct influence in four areas, in parliamentary government and direct elections, uh, in the fundamental rights, in the directive principles of state policy, obviously, the social revolution, and in the wording and the design of the legislative, executive, and judicial provisions, all of the powers under our constitution of how uh, the, the provisions of the constitution under which power is divided, both between the, the, the center and the states, but also uh, between the executive and the judiciary. He then says there is another competing or parallel or sort of, you know, naturally occurring cross current in the constitution, which is national unity and stability. And here he says, this theme influenced the federation language provisions. Uh, it influenced a lot of the legislative provisions, you know, the powers of the parliament, the competences, and then the shape of the federal structure. And then he says there were other themes, lots of other noise, other sort of, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, you know, um, sort of a miscellany of uh, different things, uh, which include he puts in minority interests, although that could fall under the other themes too, uh, efficient government and administration, and most importantly, national security. Just note national security, how low it is here, right? Although it is sort of central, obviously, to the national unity and stability theme. So this is just to show you in a schematic how he envisioned the theme of social revolution and how impactful it was in the making of our constitution, right? So. This is now a, I showed you the outline to the Constitution. Now, this is the outline of a book. Now, look at that. Look at the, this is the first page, right? Which road to the social revolution? That's his first chap second chapter. The first chapter is about how the Constituent Assembly met, who were they, what were the elections, how, how are they indirectly elected, all of that stuff is answered there. He goes into this whole issue of the big question confronting the framers was which road to take? I mean, just think of the imagery, right? Whether we take a road to socialism, like the Soviet Union, or we take a load to, let's say, a liberal free market democracy. And he says this was a big conundrum facing the members. So he looks at the alternatives. And then what road was actually taken, the reasons for the choice, right? Uh, we can go on and on, right? But he talks here then about the conscience of the Constitution, which are the directive principles. Uh, in the fundamental rights, he talks about social reform. So again, this, I submit, is one aspect of Austin which we need to rediscover, the idea that he was, if not a prophet, a uh, sort of a town crier for the idea that the Constitution is a radical, revolutionary social document. Now, we must move on, but there are two things that Austin also adds we must remember, which nobody else did at that time, for which he is a forerunner. He talked about how the Indian people were walking in darkness, and they saw this great light. It's sort of a biblical reference to the fact that there was a gong, as he put it, that reverberated around India when the Constituent Assembly decided to give universal suffrage. Against advice and practice, no other country in the world had given people who couldn't read and who didn't have property uh, the right to vote, but that was a decision taken by the Assembly, right? And a decision that worked out to be a, a bet, but a bet that was a winning bet because it created legitimacy in the Constitution. Uh, among those who did not participate in the electing of those who drafted the Constitution, but could participate in the processes that the Constitution created. And this, too, is another thing that Austin shines the light on for the first time. You now have a lot of other scholars, Onit Shani, this Israeli scholar, but it's really Austin who really says, look, one of the big achievements as part of the social revolution was the right that every Indian would get the right to vote, which, frankly, was a big experiment and an experiment that lots of people said would be doomed to fail. Now we must move on 
there were a lot of critiques of Austin. I invite you to read the one by Professor Bakshi. Uh, and uh, uh, we don't have time to get into it. But it is uh, half as long as the book, which means it was quite long. But it is also a very enriching Indian sort of response to Austin. But what does Austin then do? Right? What does the book do? It frames the narrative, the national narrative, the narrative of the creation of the republic, the, the creation story of how India became a nation. Right? And that happens through the Supreme Court. Because uh, we were discussing today, um, how did the Supreme Court get access to Austin? Austin is 27 or 28 when he writes his PhD thesis. Uh, we'll then see he disappears. But he does one thing very smartly. Within uh, um, sort of two years of him submitting his thesis, he gets it published. Published, not much money paid, but a handsome book is produced. And the Supreme Court in the year of publication, somebody probably walked to Bari Books or whatever the bookshop in Delhi was then and bought a copy and gave it to a lawyer arguing. And the Chief Justice of India then K. Subarao cites Austin as a learned author. Just imagine, as a 28 or 29-year-old, you get cited in your first book by the Chief Justice in the most important case of the time, Golaknath, where the court holds by a narrow majority that parliament has no right, has, doesn't have the power to amend the fundamental rights. Obviously, this was a very controversial decision. The minute it came down, there were attempts to overdo it, over, uh, to undo it. And so you had the 24th Amendment, the 25th Amendment, uh, all of which you may have learned in constitutional law to basically undo this holding that parliament has no power to amend the constitution. And remember, guess what all this was about? The social revolution, right? All of this was to undo what the parliament was thinking or the executive was thinking as roadblocks that the judiciary was placing in the road to the social revolution, which Austin had described, right? So in the case of Ananda Bharati case, Austin is so influential that out of the third 12 judges who write judgments, Okay, or the 12 judgments that get into 11 judgments, except one judge, everybody refers to Austin. That is, you know, barely, barely seven of, uh, years after the book's out. And this continues. You have, as I think uh, um, uh, Sudarshan mentioned, the Supreme Court referring to Austin in lots of cases. In Indira Gandhi's election case. Why important case? Because it ratified the basic structure doctrine. In the Rajasthan election case. Um, in the Minerva Mills case, which Justice Nariman is very fond of saying is one of the most important cases because it affirmed and applied the basic structure doctrine, but it's one of a narrowly divided case. Narrowly divided because three to two they divided. And guess what? Both majority and minority cite Austin right, in their support, which is quite funny. Isn't it flattering to be both cited by both the minority? And in fact, the minority sort of a central holding of the minority depends on what Austin says, which is the Constitution is a social document, right? So now you see the court silly borrowing and have taken this rhetoric quite seriously, but it's not just the court, right? Now, as recently, as, not, sort of not in the 80s, not the court only of the 80s, as recently as 2020, our present Chief Justice Chandrachud, in his decision in Gujarat Mazdur Sang about paying laborers uh, wages during the pandemic, look at his extensive sites to Austin. This, uh, I can't show you the footnotes, he's got four footnotes. And he, he puts this, see, it's, it's very clear how even Chief Justice Chandrachud sort of looks at Austin and Austin's proclamation or his heralding that the Constitution is about a social revolution. Now, we can go on and on, but let's move to Parliament. There too, Austin is cited across the aisle. Part of my research, I found people uh, from the BJP, obviously, to the communists. This is KP Unikrishnan, sort of, you know, sort of Congress, apart from Congress the DMK, all citing Austin, right? So remember, the true is not, a CY may or may not be cited in Parliament, but for a book to be cited both in the legislature and judiciary, it has to be obviously persuasive, right? Now, Austin is all over the place, right? You don't even need me to give you a summary. You can go watch Mr. DPK, whoever he is, uh, who basically does a YouTube version, who offers to help you summarize Austin. There are many of these. These are all these courses that now people prepare for judicial service exam, for CLAT, uh, for UPSC, right? Uh, the, the, Austin has now become, why, why is he, he's not necessarily giving you this just for fun, because you're going to be asked questions in the exam. And so those questions in the exam are, you know, what happened, who did what, and that's because of Austin, right? So this again, is framing the narrative in a way that no legal scholar can even dream of, right? Uh, so, then what else happens? 
Austin is the only author, legal author, who has been translated into 12 Indian languages. In fact, here's the, this is Hindi or Sanskrit? Hindi? Okay, uh, I'm joking. Uh, because uh, there is a Sanskrit version also. Uh, and uh, Kannada or Telugu, I always get confused. I think this is Telugu. Um, but um, there's, uh, if you want to read Austin in Marathi, uh, in, in, uh, in Punjabi, there, there's for you. Uh, latest issue in Kashmiri. This is just come out in May. Austin in Kashmiri, Austin in Urdu has just come out. Austin in Tamil and Malayalam, uh, under development. The National Translation Mission has chosen very few books, like Newton's Principia, for translation in all 20, 22 languages. Austin is one of those books. That, too, is, again, shaming and, uh, shaping a narrative in a very unconscious way. But we have to move on, which is about, come back to this issue of why I consider, therefore, he's a prophet or a forebearer of transformative constitution, which is the rage. And here, I'm not getting into a big debate about transformative constitution, because that will take us even longer than I'm speaking for. But very quickly, let's summarize. It mostly comes from South Africa, even though there are other antecedents. In a nutshell, the idea of transformative constitution is that a constitution, like India or like South Africa, from where this came, is a constitution, at least the 96 constitution, that came after a very dark period, a period of great darkness and despair. And so the new South Africa wanted to create this rainbow society where everyone would be equal. Right? And so it was, in a sense, a constitutional revolution that needed a radical document that would transform a society that was so in, in, uh, unequal. That's really how this idea that a constitution can be transformative came. But my point is that we didn't have to wait for the South African constitution of 1996. This already happened in India, and, already, and Austin was one of those who had already made this message. We didn't have to wait for the South Africans to tell us and then borrow it and say, oh, we're all transformatives now. We were. That's my point in this lecture. So there I must also give credit to Professor Upendra Bakshi. Before it became a rage, because Justice Chandrachud cited it and lots of other scholars, Upendra Bakshi had the wisdom in 2010 to organize a seminar in Delhi where he looked at Brazil, India, and South Africa, and he first signals the promise and the power of this idea that the Constitution is a transformative document, and that he signals in an essay he writes uh, in this volume, in the in true Bakshi uh, style, it's a let's say a, a, a piece you must read and reread, but it is a piece that we must also remember is the first piece that tries to articulate what transformative constitutionalism means in India, right? Uh, but we move on to Chief Justice Chandrachud, who, as you know, is one of the big fans of transformative constitutionalism, which is why it is in several judgments that uh, the Chief Justice then as a uh, sitting or a associate justice uh, authored Navte Johar on 377, and then of course in the Sabri Mala case, right? Uh, and we don't need to get into the merits of those cases, but you know that transformative constitutional reasoning, reasoning plays an important role in all these cases. Now, um, we move on, which is to simply say that um, I wish, uh, th there are lots of problems with uh, transformative constitutionalism, uh, there is uh, Siddharth Narayan's article. I've also written in India Forum uh, some of the problems I have with this idea of transformative constitutionalism. I believe there are limitations to where you can adopt and use this technique. So, uh, but I still think that this genie can't be put back into the bottle. You may have watched uh, Sai Deepak's art, uh, very fiery video, which I urge you to watch, both in Hindi and English. He's given a lecture recently where he talks about the limitations of transformative constitution. And he warns, and Sai Deepak is someone we must take seriously and engage with on these issues because he is a formidable debater. And he argues, I'm not saying whether I, I sort of uh, approve or not, but he argues quite passionately, transformative constitutionalism is a power grab by the judiciary. That's his view, right? Or sort of my understanding of his view. And uh, in the light of all that, though, the question is, what happens to the doctrine? We will have to now see. Maybe Chief Justice Sandra should in the same-sex marriage case, may something, say something more. It's interesting, in the last year, the Chief Justice hasn't used its doctrine much, but it may come up again. But this genie cannot be put back into the bottom. Why? This idea of transformativeness is now infecting lots of other fields of law. It's 
transformative environmental law, transformative gender justice law, right? So that's why, you know, please watch the space. But we need to move on and back to Austin, which what happened when all this buzz, right? All this is from Cornerstone. I'm saying Cornerstone was the first transformative book. He then went missing. This is 1967. He unleashes all this. The court starts quoting him. But if in the 1970s you wanted to go interview Mr. Austin, you couldn't find him. Why? Because Austin, uh, Bakshi says, he's Rip Van Winkle. He says, what happened all these years? Now we know. We know because I have access to the papers. Maybe Sudarshan knew, but not many people in India knew, which is Austin joined the State Department. See the word intelligence. Those who are, can wake up everyone. He worked for the Bureau of Intelligence. Now, this is not the CIA, OK? But it is a part of the State Department which produces national intelligence estimates for the US government. So here is an interesting memo to President Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, drafted by Granville Austin. This is the year after Cornerstone. Nothing to do with Cornerstone. This is about arms race, right? So he's moved on. He's gone to his next job. Uh, he's done his PhD, moved on to the Middle East, moved on to US foreign policy, as if, you know, next thing. Um, but it was not like India was out of his mind. The Delhi Gymkhana Club says, you're still in the waiting list. Do we want to keep you? You might get a membership in 10 years. He said yes. Then he also writes this letter, and he says, well, can I get a job in Delhi? But let's look at this unusual response he gets from his college, which is that because of America's bad name in the world, maybe you shouldn't work in India. It was the height of the Vietnam War, right? So Austin did try to come back. Obviously, he couldn't tweet about it, but it was not like he disappeared. He then holds a series of other jobs. Elliot Richardson was one of those people who was a great uh, cabinet secretary under Nixon, but Austin was not really allied with Nixon, but was fond of Elliot Richardson, so he works there, kind of working for a minister in this country. He then comes back to the State Department, working in a very influential department, policy planning, and then sort of leaves there, and then there's a variety of things between the 70s and 80s. He writes an article on higher education. Middle East is his big passion, Middle East peace. He writes articles in the New York Times. He gets hate mail for it. Uh, people write to him and say, oh, how can you say these things, right? Um, this is when he's sort of rediscovered by the man in this room. Uh, in other presentations, I show a photo of Sudarshan, but since he's sitting here in fresh and bright, and for those of you watching, if you just rewind the tape, you will see him actually have spoken. I don't need to show you his photo. But as he beautifully says uh, in an email to me, which I hope he will write in an article, he went on this frantic search to find Austin because there was a guru. I thought it was a saffron guru, but he told me today, it is T.G. Vaidyanathan, who was a film critic. Um, but a film critic, a famous professor of English in, in Bangalore, who basically said that when uh, he comes back to India, a country he hasn't been to in 20 years, then he writes this report to Sudarshan. I don't know if you've seen this. Uh, I found this, this, you know, you probably saw this a long time ago. I wanted one thing to surprise you, but maybe you saw it recently. Uh, this is a, basically a report Austin writes to Sudarshan saying, okay, I'm going to do the second book, right? But I don't know what your original plan was. This is 1987, 89, 90, 91, 92. He goes to the India International Center. He loves the bar. He talks to anyone. He will not have a drink alone. If there's a free table, he will invite himself and sit next to you and ask you who you are. Very con uh, convivial man who was really a sort of a, a magnet of information, right? But he went back home and wrote down everything, right? Look at this. This is diary uh, 17. There were over 50, right? Detail what somebody told him at this party, that party, but also very significant things. And uh, of course, see, he would kept keep all the people he met very meticulous. Look at the uh, page numbers. But at some point, all of this was too much, right? He kept writing, that's, those are notes on Minerva Mills, this is a letter from Mr. Palkiwala, Krishna Ayer, from his friend S. Guhan. Huge pile of information. You're flooded, what do you do? So he's almost about to give up, and then Nancy says, you made that promise to Sudarshan, we have to keep it. So 12 years after, or 13 years after you went knocking on the door in Washington without even a phone call because there was no email, or phone to call uh, Austin. He took a gamble, knocked on the door, said, come back to India, and he came. But it took 12 years for Austin, unlike this, bu <laughs> this building constructed in repeated time. Austin produces the book, Working, which now completes the full circle. 
this book, which describes the constitutions working, and it's sort of the second volume to Cornerstone. Now, again, we don't have time to get into the book because this book itself can take several days to go over, but obviously it gets more adulation for Austin. I think that uh, um, um, Sudarshan takes him to Kerala, and Austin writes in his diary that the Kerala judges treated him as if he framed the constitution himself because he gets such reverence and adulation, right? And so here, here you see from Raj's great mentor, the President uh, Narayan, I thought you would like this picture, Raj, because you have a similar picture with the president. Um, and here he says, I mean, which president writes to an author saying, you know, I have referred to your book. And remember, Narayanan had to deal with lots of constitutional crises, right? So this is very telling, right? Uh, now, Bakshi is back. Professor Bakshi is back. And it is a beautiful, uh, I mean, it's a frustrating. I understood 30% when I read this 20 years ago. I read it last night, and I understood about maybe 70, 65. Uh, I probably will get it, but it's beauty. There is an air of mystery to the second coming of Austin. And he says, St. Granville Austin, Professor Bakshi might listen to this, so I'm scared of saying something that might displease him, but he is not necessarily flattering Austin by calling him saint. He's saying, all of us have made Austin into a saint because we keep using him so we, we, we quote him so reverent, uh, reverently that as if he says a gospel, right? This is a beautiful review of the second book, stunning review, okay? I think it's one of the most penetrating reviews that I, I urge all of you to download and read it. Again, we don't have time to go into it, but there is one part of the review that is particularly biting. Austin says, uh, Bakshi says, Austin tells us he kind of normalizes constitutional crisis and he says that ugly as the emergency was in Delhi in 1976, it was not Berlin under Hitler. He's particularly irked by the sentence, which he feels sort of downplays emergency, right? Um, and so this criticism, though, bothers Austin. Because Austin's book is also a great documentation of emergency. We would not have known all of those decisions that were taken in the 39th Amendment, the 42nd Amendment, right? Until Austin documents them in this book. But obviously this was not enough, or maybe Bakshi felt that the narrative was a little too trying to please everyone. So Austin decides that let me write a third book, a third book that would focus only on the emergency. And so he had a lot of files. He has, you know, he had already built a huge file. In fact, Professor Christoph Jaffrello has written an entire book only looking at Austin's files on the emergency. Just recently come out book. Um, so Austin decides, though, I need to see the law ministry's files. So he writes to everyone he knew, because obviously he knew he had met Prime Minister Gujral. So he writes this very charming letter, thinking like Nehru it might work, right? That earlier letter. But he then gets the total Sarkari response. Dear Sri Granville Austin, this has reference to your letter to the Home Secretary uh, regarding an undertaking of Mrs. Gandhi's emergency to write an objective book, the matter has been looked to at the, at the moment the concerned files are classified and not impossible to make available to you. So the, unfortunately, uh, there's not much he can do. And so Austin uh, gives up, not entirely. He still writes here and there, but gradually fades away. Now, I do want to sort of conclude with three reflections, right? Um, which is about uh, why Austin still makes sense. And again, Austin, uh, the, I'm not trying to do a full reappraisal of Austin, really focusing him on this idea that he was this herald of chronicler, uh, this um, beacon for the idea of transformative constitutionalism, right? And this is important because I feel that Austin was the first to instigate awareness and a quest of understanding in our founders. I do not like the word founding fathers, as Chief Justice Tandrachu told Mr. Singhvi the other day, we're one of the countries which had founding women and men, but let's be also gender neutral. We had founding persons, founding founders of our country, right? Uh, these were people who drafted and formulated the Constitution, erected the Republic, um, and Austin legitimizes the studying of their backgrounds. Until then, people only looked at what they said in the assembly. Nobody knew where they were from, what their social background was, what their caste background was. Did they participate in the freedom movement? Were they arrested and jailed? All of that is Austin. If you look at Austin's back of Austin's book, he has a detailed bibliography of everybody, where they were born, what caste they were, uh, what was their participation in the freedom movement, um, 
what was their legal career before they joined the movement, right? All of this means you're trying to investigate a document written by people who come to the assembly with their experiences and their backgrounds, which themselves are transformative. How do you get a transformative document written by people who are bureaucrats, right? So he basically says the people in the assembly were themselves somewhat radical and revolutionary, and therefore we have a transformative document. The second thing he does, though, is to create a sense of drama about the founding of the Republic, right? And therefore, um, Sham Benekal re relies extensively on, on, on Cornerstone for the television miniseries, which I hope most of you at least have seen one chapter. Uh, it was used to be in very high Hindi for me, and actually it's sort of Hindustani, but now there is a for, uh, sort of a subtitle version which makes it more accessible to all. The debate on untouchability in the Samvidan series, for instance, is vividly portrayed for those who aren't interested or able to access the dry debates or the Shivara books that Sudarshan talked about. And you can really see the Constitution's transformative potential in the wake of harsh social realities come alive through the series, right? And Austin, in a sense, is, you know, the director gets his script from Austin, right? Now, uh, I want to point out, though, that there are notable differences between Austin's method of the Constitution being a radical social document and the contemporary understandings of transformative constitutionalism, according to Bhatia, according to Chandrachut. One is the difference is that the Austin, at least in the early writing, thought that the legislature should take the lead. He felt there were certain areas where the judiciary couldn't go into. But in the second book, after seeing what had happened in emergency, he, he sort of takes a U-turn. But at the end of the day, it's important to remember that like the Constitution being a social document, this idea of transformative constitutionalism is a method of interpretation. It can be used or misused to reach a conclusion that's right or wrong. And let's take, without getting into the merits of the case, the recent Supreme Court decision, uh, Aisha Shifa versus the state of Karnataka. Now, as you know, this decision, the judges have split, so the matter has gone to the Chief Justice, right? Um, now, in Aisha uh, Shifa, Justice Gupta notes that the social revolution ushered by the Constitution to reconstruct India's social structure on the modern foundations of secular education. And this he took to mean that religious beliefs cannot be carried to a secular school maintained out of state funds, and therefore the state could outlaw the wearing of hijab in these schools. Now, again, without entering to the rival merits of this case or the contentions made, it just shows you that reasoning that sounds transformative can be reached, can be used to employ a conclusion that transformatives may not agree with, right? So that's sort of the limited purpose of making this point. And I find, finally want to end this lecture, which I know has gone on a little longer than I expected, by narrating a conversation I had with a young law student. Uh, I met her two days ago, and I asked her why she uh, chose law school. Her answer was clear and convincing, but since uh, I thought you may not believe me, I thought let me have her explain it uh, in her own words. Hi, my name is Vidita Govindachari, and I am a first year law student at the Gujarat National Law University. Four years ago, before I knew what I really wanted to do, I came across this book entirely by chance. But even then, something compelled me to pick it up and read it. This turned out to be a decision that changed the way I look at the world. Mr. Austin's book left me with an unshakable faith in the ideals of the Indian Constitution, and it made me realize that the law is so much more than just words on a piece of paper. It is a living, breathing creation that belongs to each of us. If I'm being very honest, I can safely say that Mr. Grenville Austin's book is the reason why I decided to become a lawyer. I think that's a fitting end to this lecture. Thank you, one and all. Thank you so much, Mr. Vikram, for sharing such a deep insight into Dr. Austin's mind so, so wonderfully. Most of us didn't get a chance to unfortunately meet Dr. Austin, but uh, today's lecture feels like a personal introduction uh, to him and a rather inspiring one at that. So thank you very, very much for a wonderful lecture. Uh, we will now have a short question and answer session for about 10 minutes. I invite our guests and members of the audience to please ask any questions that you may have. We'll circulate a mic once you have any questions.
Uh, very good afternoon, sir. Uh, so uh, while listening to your lecture, uh, there were certain points that were coming to my mind. And the very first question that came was, as you have talked about the transformative uh, constitution, so what if it was not transformative? Uh, would you have written something about if the Indian constitution was not transformative as it is, we have talked about so much. So what would have been the alternative? Well, I mean, <laughs> Uh, it's an um, interesting question. If you ask me as a citizen, um, I don't know how you would have written a transformative constitution and created a republic that we have today uh, if you didn't have one, right? I mean, because at the end of the day, remember that the nation that uh, the founders inherited was a nation that had seen the, the partition violence. Um, the constitution in that sense, as Professor Bakshi says, was dipped in blood. Uh, but it was also a constitution uh, created by uh, a group of people who knew that there were harsh social realities that they had to get rid of. I think some of us don't even realize how iniquitous uh, conditions were. And if you read, for instance, Nehru's autobiography, he goes and discusses, uh, talks about uh, Kisans in UP, right? And uh, that just vividly brings you uh, sort of the conditions that prevailed in this country, right? And so. I think that there was a general consensus, at least in the political class, most, some of the elite may not have agreed, that we needed radical change, right? On caste, but also uh, in terms of socioeconomic um, uh, structures. You know, India was basically very feudal. That is why in the early years of the Republic, you had all these land reform acts. All of that would not have been possible if you didn't have a constitution that at least strove to authorize uh, sort of, let's say, you know, more redistribution or uh, a sort of a more level playing field uh, for the citizens, right? Otherwise, you would have had a constitution that was an instrument of governance and it may or may not have held the peace, right? Um, there are some who argue that this is really what saved a, a real revolution, right? A violent revolution. Uh, I always fi find it interesting when Americans describe the creation of the United States as the American Revolution. I said, well, there were some soldiers, they did fight the British, but I don't know if it's a revolution like in the French Revolution where people were guillotined. The Indian Revolution, of course, didn't see guillotines or chopped heads, but it was an Indian Revolution in terms of ideas. And so it would be very hard for a national movement that had wrapped itself around not just attaining freedom and Swaraj, but also, uh, you know, uh, through the Congress Party's um, manifestos, programs, and meetings, uh, to create an uh, agenda for change, radical change, for them to adopt a constitution that didn't go far. But it's quite possible that that may have happened. Uh, and uh, I won't speculate on the possibilities, but this is sort of my response to your very good question. Thank you so much, sir. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir, please. Yes, sir. My question is, sir, as we all know, the preamble acts as the very spirit of the constitution. Oh. And with the changing amount of transform transformative constitutionalism that we are seeing, like we have well over 100 amendments. And during probably all, all of the sessions where judges come and sit and they sit and decide and they adapt to the changing times. So don't you think that over a period of like 20, 30 years down the lane, wouldn't we as a nation or the constitution differ from the actual spirit of the constitution? Like for the namesake, the spirit of the uh, constitution, the preamble remains the st as the status quo. But in terms of acts or in terms of the laws which are being passed, wouldn't it deviate from the actual purpose and the heart of the constitution? You know, I, I think this question uh, requires reflections on various levels, but also with examples. But I think Austin had a very interesting answer. Um, first of all, on the socialism, right, he always used to quote this guy K. Santanam, who was a Madras member in the assembly, I think he was the editor of the Hindustan Times in Delhi. He said India, what India needs is more, not socialism of production, but socialism of distribution. And uh, I actually think in that sense, the rhetoric of social change, radical revolutionary change, was not doctrinaire, right? It had to be pragmatic, which is why today we can still live with the 39 B and C, and we have not, you know, in the early days of liberalization, they said the entire new economic policy was unconstitutional because it was inconsistent with the director principles. But we found ways 
to reconcile that, right? Uh, because it doesn't, it is not a constitution, even though the preamble says socialism, that mandates, you know, absolute state control. But to this question of making laws, you know, again, it's interesting to talk about Austin's um, uh, conclusion uh, to the second book, where he says, constitutions do not work or not work, they are worked by people, right? And so when they say, oh, this constitution has not worked, we have, these are his words, we, we adopted a, a foreign constitution. We, we borrowed extensively from the Government of India Act. He really feels that at the end of the day, it's the people who work these constitutions. You can have the most beautiful constitution, and that I see in the day job that I have that obviously I don't talk about in the setting, where beautiful constitutions are written by the best foreign experts, and then they shatter into pieces because there are tensions in the society that either the constitution hasn't addressed or is incapable of addressing. So to the question of making laws, I think very much this idea percolates down, which is, you know, what are the people working the Constitution, uh, and what kind of laws are they making? Uh, good afternoon, sir. My question is that uh, Mr. Austin had a considerable international exposure with the education. When he came to India, he had spent several years um, meeting all the president and people in high positions. So how far do you think that he might have been had a prejudice when he was saying that it was a social reform or a radical reform? So is it a possibility that he might have been prejudiced as compared to the Western and the Indian level of revolution when it comes to constitution? Interesting question, but remember he was an American and he was not, there were very few American Marxists uh, and he certainly was not uh, uh, someone who studied uh, Gramsci or Marx in, uh, in, in, in college, and he was someone who was a Roosevelt liberal, which meant he believed in the power of government, uh, especially in times of economic crisis, uh, grew up in the time of the New Deal where the state, right, the idea of John Maynard Keynes. So he was comfortable with the notion of a, of a state that did more than just being the night watchman state, right? Uh, and that's how perhaps he viewed initially the Constitution's uh, director principles. It really was, to him, the Rooseveltian vision of creating a just society, which under the president he later served, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson, many Americans forget, wanted to create a great society in the sense of our director principles. But I don't think he was biased. I think that he tried. Nobody is completely objective, even if they want to be. And those who say they are objective are certainly not objective because that itself is a measure of subjectivity. But yet he did meet, he met everyone from Krishna Menon uh, to, uh, you know, the communists. He went to the, uh, I was reading, finding yesterday the RSS constitution and it says compliments of your Granville Austin. If you want the RSS constitution today and you go look for it, you download it, inside it says compliments of Granville Austin. And I'm thinking, bizarre, that's, you know why? He went to the Hindu Mahasabha office and he went to the RSS office and asked for their documents, right? Just as he went to the communists and got their documents, just as he spoke to the socialists, just as he spoke to the many congressmen. So I think he did consult as much as he could a wide cross-section of people for his book, and that too was also a new method. Most scholars even today don't go and interview someone. If you're writing a book, you sit in the library, maybe Google, now chat GPT, you don't go talk to people. And I think that's the thing he did, which is still very important, right? He talked to everyone who was responsible. If he, if you were in the assembly, you were alive, he saw you. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Are we running out of time? We'll just take one more question. We're running out of time. Okay, maybe a couple more questions. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for your... Where are you? I'm here. I'm here. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. good. Thank you for your wonderful session, sir. Uh, so... I had a very brief question. So recently, uh, there has been a criticism of the Indian court uh, courts that the Indian courts give transformative judgments, but that it has re little relief, just in case of the Aadhaar judgment, where uh, the right to privacy has been upheld, but at the same time, there has been data leaks, and there is very little relief to the citizens of the country. So how do you think uh, the word transformative uh, comes to play when there is very little relief to the ones who are affected by it? Well, I, I think this is a bit outside uh, my, my talk only because I think that, like I said, in, I showed in the last case, right, 
the case that uh, the, the hijab case, where I am pretty sure that those who wanted to argue a transformative constitution in other matters would not have wanted that outcome, but it was used by a judge who, you know, reasoned in reasoning that you can quarrel with ideologically, but it's he's used the same tools that let's say a progressive would have used in another case to achieve a transformational outcome. So I think that a lot of this obviously depends on strategy, litigation strategy, and this is where I direct you to Rohit Day's book, right? Um, Rohit Day's book is a fascinating book. Um, it took, took a long book, line to write, not as long as Austin, but it is because he was the first person to go and look at the records of our Supreme Court and look at the anatomy of each case. Who are the people bringing this case? Which lawyers did they get to argue the case? what arguments were made, and which judges decided it, right? So this alchemy of reasons often is, you know, important in understanding the outcome. So to the question of whether the other case or some other case was decided rightly or wrongly, I think that these are cases that will be studied for years to come uh, by scholars who will have access to materials and insights and people who may not be willing to speak today or who, you know, understandably may not be willing to share reflections on. And so I think that uh, that is the role of scholarship to sort of interrogate outcomes, not just based on what they are, but also in the long uh, or the you know, medium term horizon of history. Uh, thank you so much, Vikram. This was not just a lecture, but it was just like a, a kind of a lived experience of simply what has happened in the evolution of not just Indian constitutional history, but also extraordinary influence of Randall Austin in the life of so many ideas. And that's why it was a very compelling narrative. Thank you so much for doing it. We are, I know for sure that uh, all those students who are sitting in this auditorium, but also others who will be watching it, it will be a life-changing experience to be, to simply uh, go through this lecture. Uh, my question to you is that, um, you know, one of the things that uh, Granville Austin, um, you know, for scholars in general, it is said that you need to pursue evidence for making your arguments and truth and discovery of truth is paramount. And wherever that evidence takes you, you will go there. Do you think that um, uh, Granville Austin was somewhat predisposed to a greater admiration of India and what Indian democracy held for itself for him to be able to make that judgment about the idea of transformative constitutionalism and even the idea that it's a primarily a social structure. Because in some ways, everything depends upon your starting point as well. And you mentioned in your talk his experience in Vietnam and Lebanon, where he was at various points of time. When he had, by the time when he had come to India, he was obviously seeing a lot of chaos. And he, and historically, when he, looked at the evidence of the constitution making process he saw more chaos but having seen chaos and have, and actually seeing chaos for him to predict that this is going to be so transformative what kind of predispositions he might have had to make that prediction and then to continue that thought process in the second book as well yeah this is a point i sort of didn't have time to deal with because i thought i was already talking so long uh, and so I kind of skipped over, but I'm glad you asked. It's the one part I, I kind of skipped over, especially in discussing the second book. The question to me was, when he comes back, and I don't know, Sudarshan, what he told you. Uh, in the first book, he says, this gong has struck. There's a social revolution. It's a radical document. And then coming back 25 years, does he revisit that? I first thought he did, but when I've been reading, rereading it, he sort of nuances, he doubles down a bit because he creates the seamless web and he says the seamless web, this is the analytical framework he creates for the working of the constitution. 
that the Indian constitution creates a seamless web of social revolution, political uh, transformation and democracy, and then security, right? That's sort of the seamless web. And uh, I think he's disappointed by the fact that in the name of the social revolution, which he says was necessary, we had to have a social revolution, the means adopted, he criticizes. And he traces this original sin to the First Amendment. That First Amendment, as you know, in our Constitution, did many things, right? But one of the things, as I think Sudarshan actually alerted Austin to this fascinating stuff, and as Sudarshan, I discovered, some researcher recently is looking at it. Um, and uh, the First Amendment, among other things, included the Ninth Schedule, right? Which is Article 31B. And uh, Sudarshan, I think, alerted Austin to the mischief of the Ninth Schedule. And I think that convinced Austin that the Ninth Schedule was a device that was wholly illegitimate, made in the name of the social revolution, that allowed subsequent amendments to basically enact reforms that rode roughshod over democracy. So he actually says that the seamless belt required an equilibrium where the social revolution, democracy, and security or unity had to be kept together. But because they amended the Constitution more frequently, and then that slid into emergency, right, which he felt was the ultimate abomination, the name of the social revolution had been misused. So what he thought was a noble goal that the founders had set, that we would reorder Indian society, was a role that was still valid. The means adopted to him were deeply troubling. And I think that he makes an amends for in the book, because the book at the end of the day, the second book, is a beautiful account of all the major cases. If you really want to understand these great cases, Shankari Prasad, Sajjan Singh, Golak Nath, Keshav, Anandam, Minerva, in very beautiful imagery, he begins with going to Minerva, seeing this dog, and see this abandoned mill. He walks there, Nanda Nilekani's father used to work in Minerva mills. He creates that setting, right? Uh, he found the Golak Nath family tree. He traces the genealogy, right? So it's a beautiful set of stories, which also Bakshi sort of slightly mocks in the review. But these stories are told to say that these cases were decided in a certain way that may not have been fully consistent with the goals of the Constitution and to achieve a revolution, but you have to see it in the context of what he thought was the legislative and executive misuse of the amendment process. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, basically what he does in the second book. He doesn't abandon the idea, but he says it was wrongly worked. Before we proceed, I invite Professor C. Rajkumar and Professor Sudarshan to please present the mementos to, Doc, to Mr. Vikram Raghavan as an expression of our gratitude. May I invite Professor C. Rajkumar, Professor Srijit, and Professor Sudarshan. All right, before I do that, I just want to say that uh, for all of us who went through this ex experience, it's so, uh, so gripping. But it's also an amazing um, opportunity for our faculty members to look at the pedagogy of teaching. I mean, you know, Vikram was so modest in, he's so modest about the fact that he's not an academic and he doesn't have a PhD and, uh, but uh, I have had, I mean, the, the one other experience I had was uh, Al Gore giving this lecture on the earth. Have you seen that movie, Earth? So this is this kind of moving account. Because normally I'm so, um, you know, uh, intolerant about PowerPoints. Uh, somebody said quite remarkably, power corrupts, PowerPoint corrupts, absolutely. Uh, and uh, so I just do not like PowerPoints, but this was one such exercise where he so beautifully wove woven his arguments surrounding the life and the contribution of uh, Dr. Granville Austin. So thank you so much, Vikram, for doing what you did. Uh, it's simply amazing. And uh, I know for sure that students, faculty members, not just now, but generations uh, of students who are going to um, you know, watch this will be truly inspired. I want to also recognize the presence of uh, an extraordinary person who happened to be here today, uh, besides our faculty and staff and students, uh, Ms. Rosemary Sagar. Rosemary Sagar is the Chief Investment Officer of uh, Sagar family. But you may be aware that uh, her father established in way back in 1827 a firm called uh, Remfree and Sagar. 
and um, she happens to be here. So thank you, Rosemary, for your presence and uh, participation uh, in this lecture. Uh, let me now have the privilege of formally presenting a memento uh, to uh, Vikram. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before we come to an end to today's insightful event, I invite Professor Akhati Tripathi, Assistant Professor, Jindal Global Law School, to please share the concluding remarks. Thank you, Surbi. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I am Akriti Tripathi, Assistant Professor and Deputy Director of the three-year and five-year law programs at JGLS. Um, I may just take the liberty to say that this lecture has not been only a historical as well as a futuristic insight into the contributions of Dr. Granville Austin, but actually an example of shared history, especially with Professor Sh Sudarshan's, I would say, close association. So I think it's been quite a privilege and an honor. I would like to begin by thanking our esteemed speaker for the day, uh, Mr. Raghavan. Thank you so much for taking out time and thank you for reminding us of the radical potential that our constitution possesses and our sense of being as citizens of this country uh, of being Indian. We truly trace it back to the Indian constitution as chaotic and as colorful the history is. Apart from that, obviously, Professor Dr. C. Raj Kumar, founding vice chancellor of JGLS, Professor Sriji, Professor Sudarshan. Um, I am obviously presenting this on behalf of Professor Sridhar Patnayak. So it, it, will, I, it will be injustice if I do not acknowledge his absence today. Apart from that, assistant deans, uh, the team for as well as faculty members, dear, dear students for being so patient, bearing the cold um, in, the, in, in the room for a very, very interesting lecture. Our staff members, our IT team, and everybody else who've been so keenly involved in making this lecture come to fruition and so successfully. So we're very indebted to you. Thank you, thank you so much for a meaningful lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, the students are requested to be seated for just two minutes, waiting for the guests to leave the hall.